we're going to start by um, kind of introducing ourselves. Tell us where you're situated in your feminism. My name is Aluela Tim and I'm from South Sudan, currently also based in South Sudan. In South Sudan, you know, feminism is a very, very baby concept. Every feminist thing you do is just taken as radical. But I would think that I'm not yet at a point where I'm radical, but that is where I'm heading in my, in, in my feminism. My name is Aisha Ali Haji. I am a Kenyan feminist based in Nairobi. I feel like my feminism has gone inwards. It's gone uh, to, to me, to myself, to what I'm thinking, how I'm thinking, um, learning and unlearning, reading, and, and just basically doing those internal conversations, that internal work. And then also, secondly, I feel uh, my feminism now is moving more towards um, community uh, work. I think my feminism has become quieter that, but that doesn't mean that it's uh, stopping radical. My message is constantly sharp, yes. Uh, so how are you? I'm Ruti Tuarek, I'm from Ethiopia. Uh, so my feminism lies and I think just before four months or three months, I, I fully transitioned to a very radical feminist. I'm in the quest to understand what Ethiopian feminism is and how does it really has an intersection between uh, Pan-African feminism and Ethiopian feminism. There's been a lot of writing and a lot of conversation about uh, advocacy and how people are coping in times of COVID-19. But we have had very minimal or little um, writings and conversations about how feminists are coping. You can see mentions of how gender-based violence or gender violations have increased during COVID-19. We have higher cases of femicide, we have higher cases of gender-based violence, we have higher cases of defilements. So this conversation was supposed to first, of course, uh, re-energize us, give us a platform to be able to, you know, even at the least, vent of what is happening with COVID and how we are all managing in our various spaces. Uh, we also thought it was also important to try and see which of the which of the feminists or who has managed to engage state actors, and also non-state actors who have uh, probably been in committees or are convening purposely to try and strategize during this particular period and what are the plans that they have put in place and that these plans something that we can borrow and also it's a platform for us to be able to highlight any challenges that we think um, could be discussed and probably we could come up with ways in which we can address them going forward. Thank you so much uh, Caroline. <laughs> um, yeah what makes you angry like Anger is like a justified feeling to oppression, right? And our advocacy work is, is a response to the so many angers that we feel. Um, of course, feminism is, is, is an act of love. It's an act of care. For example, if you ask what well, makes you angry, the fact that I can't go outside and then walk in peace makes me angry. So what makes you angry? I hate that men are still an obstacle. Every single conversation has to start with the basics with them. For example, uh, cases of violence have increased. Let's talk about what we can do to fix it. But then first with men, we have to go, oh, actually violence exists. It feels like there's this block that can't allow us to move forward. And so we have to strategize, to be clever, to figure out how to go over it, to go around it. And I hate that. I just want that obstacle gone. I don't want to deal with them anymore. I don't want to teach them anymore. I don't want to negotiate with them anymore. I don't want to discuss anything with any, them anymore. I just want them to move out of my way. Uh, in regards to my advocacy, te technologies are allowed us to continue doing advocacy work. Majority of Kenyans have a mobile phone that has access to the internet, but then access to the internet is not just the mobile phone, it's um, the money to buy the, the bundles to be able to connect, right? And, and also, um, where you're gonna get this information? Like you can't just like just having the 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 tool, but then who's gonna lead you towards the right the information? Who's gonna lead you towards the the work? So there are women who are being left behind, and so then what is it that we can do to ensure that as we move together forward collectively, we move forward um, together? Yeah. The other things that really really make me angry 
is the fact that, for example, I cannot just, you know, leave my house and walk on the streets freely without, you know, men and, and boys, random men and boys, you know, harassing me, sexually harassing me and, you know, being considered as someone that is dressing indecently for men. And the other thing that also really makes me angry, and this is something that I'm trying to unlearn, is the fact that being raised in a household that, you know, embedded the aspect of care and domestic work as a girl child's role. If you live in a space with people that don't have jobs, you know, but somehow the burden of making sure whether somehow there's food available or whoever is in the house is okay, the health, the, the care, the, the domestic work is something that makes me very angry on a personal level. COVID-19 hasn't really, I wouldn't say the cases of se sexual violence have increased in South Sudan, but the fact that there's all this reporting on the issues and still zero action, you know, who you chase something six months, you know, four weeks, five weeks down the road and still, you know, nothing is coming through. The fact that society is not as angry about sexual violence as I am. And coming to my advocacy work, the pandemic probably found me in a space where I'm thinking digital. We live in an era where people look to the internet and media for literally everything. Our stories have often been told, you know, by outsiders. There's very, very minimal information uh, out there that is written by South Sudanese, specifically also on, on South Sudanese women. We don't have that much uh, content especially on that on the digital space and that's one of the bridges we're trying to 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 one of the gaps we're trying to bridge with gender talk uh, 211 collecting uh, d data collecting information on phenomenal women south sudanese women that played different uh, important roles that you know led to the liberation of the country for me what makes me angry is uh, we can start with that the fact that we have to have a conversation about common decency uh, the government is really making me angry. The fact that we have to ask questions several times and the only thing we can get is mockery is really, really frustrating for me. So about my activism, I'm actually part of a feminist group called Yellow Movement. I'm sure you all know it. So before the pandemic, we used to do all uh, offline activism most of the time, but you also have very big online activisms. Uh, but now that the universities are closed, we had to move our online activism, offline activism back to online. We've been more into information giving, aware, awareness creation, also like, you know, d d distressing information. So we have been doing this so far. You're all doing amazing work. So this basically takes me uh, to my second question, which is, um, but I was wondering if there is any, you know, original collaborative efforts that you've heard of or been a part of. I know so many individual feminists, but very few uh, feminist movements, coalitions or networks or, or groups, you know, and I will speak uh, specifically uh, into uh, about South Sudan we're still not yet there. And in as much as we have individual feminists, I think we need to create intentional time to host a lot of these regional convenings that bring different feminists together. Because it's one thing to connect digitally, and it's another to share the space with, with, with some of these amazing feminists. I remember one of my favorite days on Twitter was that uh, day a few years ago when we did a feminist while African hashtag. It got women from all over Africa just talking about their personal experiences uh, of being a feminist in Africa. And um, it's, it's really opened up a, net, a network of feminists who can call upon each other, support each other. So whenever we talk about uh, Pan-Africanism, I always think about who is able to be an, a Pan-African to begin with. With, without even thinking about which feminist is allowed to be a Pan-African. So already that's a privileged position. And it's important to think of those who can't get into these rooms and how we can dismantle the systems that prevent them to get into these rooms. Another thing um, uh, is what I call uh, institutionalized feminism. The organizations that are feminist organization or work with feminists, I feel like they have a central role to play because these organizations most of the time have the resources. So have a media platform where women from different countries across Africa can access, can contribute to, can talk to each other from. And I feel that would be a more, a better Pan-African, Africanist feminist movement, which is inclusive of everybody, not just those who are able to move from country to country.
how can we create a pan-African feminist movement? And while we're creating it, how can we make sure that we left no one behind and everyone is in the conversation and everyone is involved with? We can always try, but and we can always, you know, there will be someone we left behind. Uh, but at least we need to, the organization and individual should take the lead, I say. And if it's not institutionalized, we can, we can never have the guarantee that it's going to continue, you know? This is not something that's done by individuals' uh, passion or energy. It can be, it should be institutionalized, in my opinion. Um, I think also we suffer from, um, uh, what do I call it, a uh, way in which popular countries are, are highlighted more. For example, in the African continent, you'll always see a Nigerian, you'll always see a South African, you'll always see a Kenyan. But there's so many Af- other African countries that we, we sort of are not um, highlighted, especially by the media. So we need to actually do the work to find uh, the feminists in these countries and sort of, if we have big platforms, push them into the forefront. I feel feminism is a language that we speak, you know? Um, and if you don't speak a certain type of language, then you're denied spaces. Uh, in Ethiopia, um, we use, you know, local languages. And the fact that uh, local language users are denied from this spaces, this feminist uh, coalition building is also a concern. When I designed this project, the reason is also kind of to open up the space, like to share the space, right? To expand the space. Most of the time, like feminist movements are also criticized, like, you know, being collection of uh, the privileged few but if you really believe that you're privileged and if you use that privilege to speak up and to amplify voices i think that's really important jama asked a question eh, on the chat how do we reconcile these with the often problematic approaches of institutions working for women to make sure the focus is always on the interest of women um that will come also with a question that i had which can also be answered later or after the conversation on when ruth spoke about institutionalizing support what does that look like the general faulty perception is that uh, feminists are resilient and that global devastation shouldn't stop the production of feminist free labor that some of feminists should be accustomed to pain and give endlessly so how do we uh, see the boundary between strong and making feminists to be accustomed to pain and making pain to women a thing that um, a phase that everybody should go through? What really are your thoughts on that? When you're an activist, people expect you to be a sacrificial lamb. It's similar with feminist activism where you're expected to always be on the front line, always giving your time, always giving your knowledge, always giving your labor. And that's why um, whenever there's an issue on social, on Twitter, it's like, where are the feminists? Why aren't the feminists saying anything about this? And then there's this idea also that the totality of a feminist's life should entirely be about the cause. Um, you're supposed to put aside your personal life, your ambition, your joys, your desires. The end game for us is freedom. And why, why are we fighting for freedom? We want freedom so that we can build our lives also. So I want feminists to build their lives for themselves, a, a life away from this work, a life where you can experience love, care, joy, kindness. I want feminists to also know that it's okay to quit. You can, st- you can st- take a step back and figure out a different way to offer support. The pandemic really also affects us, like just that it's affecting everyone and it's affecting every sector. It also affects activism. It also affects, you know, so we have to sit back for ourselves and reflect on ourselves as well. You know, whenever there's something in, like, I don't know, in Ethiopia, whenever something's wrong, everyone say like, where are the feministers? Where are they when this happens? Where are they when that happens? And when people say, where are the feministers? They are probably there crying their eyes out and not knowing what to do. And we are not responsible for anyone and we're not responsible for everything that's happening in the country. Personally, also, just to add on that thing, patriarchy is constantly rebranding uh, itself into different appealing packages to women. When you hear people define, you know, a strong woman, what they often mean is usually that woman with multiple, you know, mentally, emotionally, financially, physically labor intensive identities. You wear all these hats, you know, you're, you're the first person to wake up, last person to get asleep. The patriarchal exploitation of women has been rebranded as strong women. Um, something I keep telling people is that feminism is not a profession. So this question for where are the feminists, we are also right bearers. We are really not at duty bearers. So when there's gender-based violence, it's not feminists who are supposed to solve gender-based violence. Feminists can only advocate 
for gender-based violence to be solved. And advocacy can be done by anybody. I will proceed to the next question. Has there been any mention or response from your government to address the ask and actions feminists are calling for? We have been, you know, the feminists in Ethiopia have been asking so many questions, starting from the very rising of uh, the gender-based violence, the domestic violence, uh, the child marriage. You know, the government is really taking this lightly and saying, uh, you know what, there hasn't been that much of a rise of uh, gender-based violence, only there is a problem in terms of the, the documentation. Uh, with, there is no case, you know, so the, when the, the prime minister ask this question that what are you doing and this and that they said uh, we've, we're doing everything in our power to answer to your questions but your questions are non-ending so for me the government have have not been doing anything similar case from a kenyan perspective the government does, has not really engaged with feminism on any level an example is uh, how but women raise the issue regarding the fact that the two-third gender rule has not been um, implemented in Kenya. In 2017, we even did a petition to the Chief Justice to dissolve Parliament because it was unconstitutional. It was completely ignored. Now, suddenly, because the dissolution of Parliament serves certain interests, that conversation has been brought back and the face of it has changed completely. It's now uh, men at the forefront, the Law Society of Kenya. Yes, they gave us some space to talk about it, but the fact that we were the first ones to actually petition uh, the Chief Justice about this was completely erased and ignored. So I also think another thing is that many of the women empowerment organizations have not adopted feminist ideology in their work. Rooting your organization in feminism should be the first step to start working with the government to, to implement some of these things, yeah. Kenya is somewhere. For South Sudan, I won't even say we've started. We have a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, uh, women-led and women's organizations. A few of the women in those organizations identify as feminists, but their organizations are not feminist organizations. It's not something. And so when they go to negotiate or when, you know, people go as women's rights organizations, they're not going as feminist women's rights organizations. And my government is they do some of these commitments, you know, to address all forms of violence against women. But I often ask myself, because if we have a body that is referred to as the, uh, the Ministry of Gender, Child and Social Welfare, that is a ministry of everybody because, you know, gender is both it's, it's literally everyone you know and then they reduce it to be the, the ministry that looks into all issues to do with women's rights in South Sudan and I just personally believe that governments that must be constantly checked to do good by their women and girls are not governments that, that were meant for us to begin with and when you raise issue of women's need they're like but you have women in the government I'm like, but yeah, but are they really, you know, are they thinking feminists? Are they putting in, uh, women's needs and interests at the center of every conversation on the table? So we're still, we're not even close to, 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 to you know, getting some of these issues institutionalized in, in South Sudan. So, you know, one of the things that uh, the Ethiopian government is, is also using to silence women is, but you guys have uh, women representation everywhere. You know, the president is woman. But like, are these women actually feminist? Do they bring the women agenda, the feminist agenda on the table? No. Do they even consider to bring it? No. Are they even willing? No. So we, can, we can't even ask them to do this and that for us. The second thing is, the second that's so annoying is, also we don't have the feminist institutions in Ethiopia, we're only one organization. So I think, you know, in Ethiopia, the government is something that's constantly making me angry again. We have to be strategic as feminists when we want to put women in the system because the system will swallow you whole. So the woman who goes in there has to be a feminist woman with a feminist ideology and agenda to push. And I get it that representation on its own is a big deal seeing women out there, seeing women in these spaces, it's a big deal. But we're at a point where representation alone is not enough. I just wanted to kind of like go to like our final question. What are the solutions? What are the demands? What are our asks, you know, as regional feminists, as, as pan-Africanist feminists? 
what, what are we asking, uh, you know, uh, our governments, other civil society organizations, actors? Um, I mean, the gendered impact of COVID-19 is, is devastating. What do you want to see change? I think for me, um, the, the issue of violence, the fact that women are not safe at home, the increase of domestic violence because women can't leave their homes, and the casualness of it. How do you read a story where this number of teenage girls in the last three months are pregnant, majority of them underage, and you just move on with your life as, as, a, as, a, as a government, as, as a person in minister in charge, you know, as the media, the fact that a woman is literally murdered every single day in South Africa, that alone should have stopped everybody. As African feminists, we need Africa-wide action to change violence against women. And then the other thing is, I feel like there isn't a, a conversation regarding how COVID is hitting women worse than, than, than men, not the disease itself, but the, the, the effects of COVID. When there is no health care, it affects women more. You know, when there are no jobs, it affects women more, right? There's, of course, oh, we need stimulus packages. We need the government to do this. I think we need to start pushing this differentiator in the conversation so that the, 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 the solutions can also cater to that specific way in which women are affected. Now that uh, there's no work, now that like school is closed, we don't have to design our solutions by thinking that you know every woman is the same. So the government should really, really know that women are not homogeneous. The society is not homogeneous. It really is different. And pandemics every time really affects those underprivileged ones more than the privileged ones. Right, you know, the pandemic has just really exposed the the everyday vulnerabilities and realities of women, girls, and other marginalized, you know, groups that feminists shed light on almost every single day. We're seeing, you know, issues of sexual and gender-based violence, domestic violence, and people think that, you know, these things are increasing. But I think the pandemic has, has just enabled the world to pause or South Sudan to pause enough to actually pay and listen, pay attention and listen to some of these issues that, that get, you know, that feminists highlight almost every day, but you know, no one seems to, to be paying attention to. And the other thing that I could, it could be specific to only South Sudan. We still have academic institutions that are very patriarchal and you know, the kind of issues that they choose to focus their research on influences things that get to make it to national uh, priorities or issues that need to be addressed. For example, how many institutions or government institutions actually have sexual harassment and exploitation policies within their institutions, you know. And so I think we have an opportunity to leverage this exposure to push harder uh, as feminists and whole governments uh, accountable. Wow, thank you so much, guys. That was so rich. Uh, in terms of the expected results of this conversation, I really see an African feminist joint statement, you know, urging governments to include the protection of women because we deserve to live in a safe world. I mean, there's no where we're going to negotiate, you know, on uh, our safety, on our right to life and our, our life to, you know, basic, basic human dignity. But having said that, I just wanted to ask uh, one of the questions, how does pan-African feminism seek to distinguish itself from Western ideology in both practice and presentation? For many people, when they encounter feminism, uh, it's most of the times through a Western perspective. How do we then bring it back home? A lot of African feminism is academic. If, you, if you're part of, of that space, then you're able to access. So maybe the work is to translate that, um, make it available on social media, um, break it down in, in language that is understandable. In, in the Western world, there are media platforms that are wholly feminist, you know? So that makes it so easy for their information to be, you know, shared and, 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 and disseminated in that way. I think maybe that's what we need, yeah. A couple of weeks back, we did a call for papers in one of our journals, African journals. We have African feminism that is specifically contextualized for African women. So the problem or the gap is in documentation. Well, I'll take your point and try and see how it is. We can simplify those after the journal is out, how we can simplify the content into um, accessible 
social media platforms. That question is an opportunity for us to also challenge ourselves in, in our feminist work. You know, how much of our own Pan-African feminist uh, you know, resources are we referencing, are we using to, to design our programs, our activism? In as much as most of the, uh, the Pan-African feminism is academic, it's also not accessible to people that are not necessarily academic, but also need that information to do their advocacy, to do their programming at grassroots, at national and, and at different kinds of, of levels. Why do we start doing this? Uh, we all have different problems and we all have different reasons to do what we're doing. The most important thing is to stay to true to our like our questions and our cause to really make us stick to our pan African feminism and cling to it. Um, thank you everybody for that. First of all, I think it's really important to acknowledge, you know, the knowledge produced by ourselves. Uh, but also I see I, I draw a lot from you know African American writers and so definitely the ideological, you know, narratives, articulations help me understand what's going on around me. But in terms of how to practice that on the daily, it's for me, Pan-African uh, feminist movement is understood in terms of that uh, collaborative, you know, solidarity building amongst ourselves also. I think we can draw lessons from each other. Unless otherwise, I think we're wrapping up now. If you could just like, I just want to ask our speakers if they could just tell us their, their favorite African, you know, Pan-African feminist. Yes, of course, definitely Stella Nyanzi, who in the last year or so has properly re-energized us. I would like to mention Jama. Zim, Zim of course, there's so many. Uh, Timehin are in, inspire me on a daily basis, yeah. For me, I say, I don't know if you know her, Stella Musi, but also Stella Nyanzi recently, you know, I was like, I think she's the one that makes me a very radical feminist. From my side, thank you so much and... Uh feminist solidarity, you know, rooted in our Africanness. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.